So, um, in Buddhism, uh, many good things come in threes. And uh, one of them is uh, the three trainings. And, uh, and the other one is the three underlying kind of guidelines for those trainings. Another is that um, each of those three trainings have three aspects. So I'm going to do a lot of threes today. And uh, as an introduction to it, I'd like to say that um, <clears throat> uh, I think you know Buddhism is notoriously famous for all its lists. And there's uh, some people get a little bit annoyed by all these lists, and it seems like it's uh, very analytical, abstract, kind of you know, kind of, uh, and all of it. But I think there's a, uh, how I understand it is that um, uh, these teachings are not meant to point to some individual essential truth or philosophical truth or thing. This is how it is. But rather is a deep understanding, deep uh, exploration of our lives and our lives are an ecology, ecosystem of many factors. And when you look at all these different lists, it's, uh, uh, it's, be, it's because there are all these different species, kind of, in the ecosystem. And they all interact in different ways with each other. And sometimes we focus on one, sometimes the other. But in order to understand the ecosystem, you have to understand how they all work together in a kind of balance. So, uh, uh, in something called the three trainings, uh, this is a fundamental aspect of the Buddha's teachings, that there are three categories of areas of training. And it isn't just like one thing we're supposed to do, but depending on the causes and conditions, uh, different parts of this training come into play. And depending on what's going on, depending on what's going on internally, what's depending on what's going on in the world, you might take a, a, engage more in one of these trainings than the others, or a com combination of them. And so we get a sense of a dy dynamic unfolding, a dynamic, dynamic kind of participation in our lived life, as opposed to you know, one shoe fits all. You know, there's one practice, one thing, one understanding, and that's you know, hold on to that for dear life, and let reality somehow cope with you rather than. Uh, us trying to be wisely cope with the reality, which is constantly shifting. So these three trainings, it's also interesting to call it trainings. Uh, the, the, um, there's not exactly a word in early Buddhism for, uh, uh, that uh, translates into our po very popular English, Buddhist English word, uh, practice. Buddhists like to practice. And they're practicing and practicing and practicing. And Bob Thurman said, um, these Buddhists, they're always talking about practicing, practicing, practicing. When's the performance? <laughs> and um, so um, <clears throat> the, um, <coughs> the, the comparable word, not the same word, the comparable word that covers the same kind of idea, kind of, in ancient language, is the word cultivate. And so, uh, here in the West, we might say, what are you practicing? And then we have a particular idea of what that means. And I think sometimes it means I'm practicing, um, you know, meditation, vipassana, concentration, metta. People usually respond with referring to a technique, the thing, the technique they're practicing. The ancient word is to cultivate. And then if you ask someone, what are you cultivating? You get a kind of different answer. What are you trying to develop in yourself? I'm trying to develop loving kindness. I'm trying to de de develop patience or develop equanimity or develop receptivity or develop acceptance or develop, I'm trying to, and so rather than focusing on a technique, it's focusing on personal qualities we're trying to grow and, and and you have a very different feeling, different emphasis. And when you talk about practices, you're kind of pointing to something outside of the ecosystem, kind of like a thing. 
whereas we talk about what you're cultivating, you're pointing really something more close in and intimate. So in the same way, the word training uh, maybe fits between those two, but uh, training uh, implies both what you're doing, but also what you're training for. And so what are you training for? And one of the things we train for uh, is certainly is liberation or freedom, uh, not getting caught. But there are three, again, coming back to all good things in three, there are three underlying principles that support these three trainings that the Buddha taught. I'll say the principles and then we'll get into the training. The, um, the, again, these principles, fundamental principles, are not philosophies. They're not, uh, uh, you know, some kind of uh, metaphysical <coughs> truth about the nature of reality, but rather have to do with um, um, inner qualities that are emphasized to be developed, to be cultivated, kind of. So these three principles that underlie all the Buddhist practice are uh, to do no harm, to cultivate, to cultivate is what is helpful, and to purify the heart. Those three things. So don't, har- don't cause harm. Cultivate what is helpful, helpful for our welfare and the welfare of others, and purify the heart. I think that's beautiful things. So how do we do that? So, and at different days, we're focusing on different ones of those. But how do we do this? And, um, and so these are the three trainings. The three trainings are three big areas, not just one individual ca- uh, trainings, but three di- big areas that uh, Buddhist practice, practices are divided up into. So the first is uh, training in ethics training in uh, virtue. The second is training in samadhi, training the mind, cultivating the mind, cultivating the heart. And the third is uh, training in wisdom or in insight. And, um, and so the first one, training in virtue or ethics, has to do with kind of how we behave kind of in most ob- more obvious ways in as we live our life. So certainly, so there's three areas of training in ethics, always three, right? There is a training, uh, um, the, uh, the uh, uh, training of the body, of speech, and of mind. So we want to be careful with what we actually do, a behavior we engage in, that we're not causing harm. And so, uh, uh, very important is not ca- this today, not causing harm is paramount in Buddhism. Uh, in terms of the uh, lay precepts, uh, very important is not to kill. Not to kill anything, if you can help it. Then not to steal. And there's a little bit higher uh, kind of de- uh, degree of emphasis or kind of like higher bar because literal wording is um, you don't take what is not given. So even if you think it can be taken, uh, you're supposed to wait until it's offered or it's clearly kind of clearly been stated you can have it. And then uh, not engaging in sexual misconduct, which the easiest way of understanding that is uh, don't cause harm to anyone through your sexuality. And then the fourth is, uh, so that's the three kind of physical things of the body. And then there's the training of the, of, um, in terms of speech, the primary one is uh, don't lie. But then there's also uh, a little more refined care around speech. Um, don't have divisive speech. Don't speak in such a way that you divide people uh, against each other. Uh, so no gossip and no slander. And, uh, and also, uh, it's a little funny, I don't quite know what it means in the ancient, ancient language, but it's usually translated in English as uh, no frivolous speech or no idle chatter. And a lot of good social relationships build around kind of, you know, idle chatter where you get to know each other and just talking. So I don't think it means, it must mean something specific. It probably means a kind of idle chatter which doesn't do anyone any good, whatever that is. And, um, and, uh, and then uh, there's uh, trainings of the, of the mind having to do with ethics. 
and that is to uh, be very be careful so that the, the mental uh, dispositions, the mental uh, thoughts, ideas, impulses to do the physical and verbal harm is held in check. It's somehow settled down. So those are trainings. So rather than it being all or nothing, you shall not kill, you shall not steal and all that, uh, of course you shouldn't, but uh, it's considered a training. And so uh, the idea is to develop and grow in the capacity to do that. And uh, the primary training uh, to do this is called uh, restraint. And I think many people don't come to Buddhism to learn restraint. It's kind of like, you know, if that was the advertisement, come and learn restraint. <laughs> you know, probably not a lot of people would come. But uh, it's a powerful thing to learn to uh, uh, keep your impulses in check so that you don't cause harm. Not so that you're repressed, but so that, you know, it doesn't, you know, uh, other people don't have to deal with your the repercussions of your harmful behavior. And so for uh, traditionally in Buddhism, this is considered the first training, and people would get this kind of coarser aspect of their life, the physical manifestation of uh, their ethics, uh, uh, developed and trained and refined, so that ethically they can go through their world in a good way. And, um, and the purpose, one of the purposes for that, in terms of the personal training, uh, is uh, to develop a certain kind of happiness. And uh, it's usually characterized as the happiness of blamelessness. The happiness of not, uh, of no one can blame you for your behavior. You're not going to do anything or say anything that people are going to blame you. Like, you really blew it. You really did a terrible thing there. And there's a certain happiness that can become that we can go through the world and you know that you have not... You know, no one has any cause or reason to blame you, and you feel kind of good. I was quite surprised when I was first went to Thailand, to my first contact with this early Buddhist tradition, and I met people there who were happy because they were ethical. And I thought, that's bizarre. <laughs> you know, I, I hadn't grown up in any kind of context at all that someone would, you know, reflect on their ethics and their behavior and and they feel happy because, you know, um, and, uh, you know, I, I was, you know, more or less ethical growing up, mostly from a lack of imagination. <laughs> and, um, <laughs> but it, it hadn't occurred, it hadn't, hadn't occurred to me that this, you know, that I should be content with it. If anything, someone had asked me, I would have thought that, you know, that someone who was, you know, super ethical, I was kind of suspicious of, or, you know, somehow goody two-shoe or something. And, um, but the idea you'd be happy. And so I met these people in Thailand who were that way. And uh, after practicing for a long time in Thailand, for a fairly long time, um, the uh, kind of intensely involved, immersed in the practice there, um, lo and behold, I discovered a kind of uh, inner ethical goodness that could surface inside of me. And I felt happy at being there. Wow, that's why they're happy. This is good. So the idea is not just to be ethical, and you know, for some policy you're supposed to be ethical, but it's really a way of training ourselves and cultivating a capacity for well-being and happiness. Which is also the purpose for the second training. And the second training is in samadhi, sometimes in English translated as concentration, but I, that doesn't really do justice to the word. It's uh, cultivating states of well-being. And there's a range of states we can, we can cultivate. And the idea is to cultivate, train ourselves to enter into states of well-being. As, uh, there's plenty of people who, uh, without in, uh, consciously thinking they're doing it, uh, have trained themselves to cultivate sta- states of ill-being. You know, if you people who kind of are training, uh, some people have really trained themselves quite proficiently uh, in resentment, you know, or hate, or disappointment, or self-criticism, or all these kinds of ruminations of the mind, a constant kind of way of talk, self-talk, which kind of undermines us and kind of deflates us. It's a kind of training. It's a training in the sense that it's conditioning 
whatever we do repeatedly conditions the mind. And sometimes it's very hard to overcome the very strong habit of mind, um, you know, just by snapping your fingers or thinking that you can just stop doing it. If the, some of these uh, trains of thoughts and dispositions have been going on for, you know, decades. So it's a training to begin reversing or changing direction of the dispositions, the habitual momentum of our mind from what is undermining us to what is supporting us and creates, so allows us to develop states of well-being. And one definition I have for samadhi is um, uh, kind of kind of a gilism for how to understand it. <coughs> That samadhi, the practice of samadhi, is to um, fill out into the happiness that's here. It's kind of like you have bought clothes which are too big. Maybe your kid growing up and the clothes are too big. And so with time you'll fill into them. You keep growing, eating and growing. So we're filling in into the happiness. And I, I like this way of filling in because it's, it's not a narrowing and constricting around samadhi. It's an opening and expanding into something, uh, wonderful states. <clears throat> so it's training the mind, and uh, in this all, kinds of, all kinds of things we can train the mind to do. We can train the mind to concentrate, and that's a very powerful thing to do. Our minds become sharper, smarter, more capable once we're concentrated and have ability to concentrate. We can cultivate, uh, train the mind to be mindful, it's also very helpful to have heightened ability to be sensitive and attentive to what's going on inside and outside. We can train the mind in, um, in loving kindness or compassion. We can train the mind in patience and equanimity, generosity. There's all these things we can train that are helpful to train. And, uh, and the operating is very important idea. This, that these, are the, these are the helpful states to develop, not because it's obligatory, not because you're a bad person if you don't, but rather it's just a helpful thing to do. And uh, so you want to kind of spend your time cultivating what's helpful as opposed to cultivating what's unhelpful. Um, I think sometimes it feels like the, la- the, you know, the easy way for some minds to operate is to go, you know, the one that has the most ease, and if you're lazy, especially good to take that which is easiest, it's easiest is to follow the habits of the mind that are well-grooved channels. And if some of those are not helpful, like I said earlier, and deleterious to have those thoughts over and over and over again, um, it can feel so comforting to follow the easy route. And it can feel like, why should I burden myself with follow the hard route of having a good states of mind and cultivate goodness in the mind? And isn't that kind of artificial? And isn't that, you know, kind of, you know, there can be a lot of protests. But one way or the other, whether you're in charge or not, your mind is constantly being shaped by what's happening in your environment and what's happening with you and what you do. If, you, if all you did was listen to politicians and, and uh, watch advertisements, and that was the only conditioning effect of your mind, it's frightening what I think would happen. <laughs> the... Um, uh, there are people who want to shape your mind and want to shape how you think and how you feel. And, uh, and, it, and if you just listen to all those things over and over and over again, it will shape you. And uh, if, uh, so, to, so, so to begin being shaped in healthy ways, it takes a little time. It takes a little effort at first and maybe it feels like a climbing uphill and hard work. But to change the direction of the mind is a worthwhile thing to do, and it leads to it becoming a habit. It, the, those channels become well, well oiled, and it's easy after a while. That's just the obvious place to go. That's what we do. So to train in these different qualities, and in this thing about uh, three some th- three things, um, there's three primary things uh, va- values of samadhi of uh, this developing this meditation practice, developing the mind. And these three things are cultivating stability, cultivating um, happiness, and cultivating confidence, self-confidence. 
uh, stability, well-being, and confidence. <clears throat> and one of the functions of especially concentration practice and meditation practice is to settle the agitation of the mind, the uh, wobbling of the mind, the centrifugal force outwards of the mind, the f- fragmentations of the mind that can happen when the mind jumps around and thinks all these different things, and concerns and fears and preoccupations and greeds, and to begin settling the mind so the agitated energy of the mind begins to quiet down, so that the turmoil in the heart begins to rest, so that uh, the mind's um, um, fragility and oversensitivity kind of to everything that goes on becomes uh, more, st- the mind becomes stronger, more stable, more resilient. Um, but uh, the, the word st- settled mind, a stable mind. So that uh, whatever's going on in the world, whatever it, it impacts us, we are not impacted so bigly. We're not thrown off uh, course by it or, uh, you know. <clears throat> so have stability. The second is to cultivate this happiness or well-being. All the concentration practices in Buddhism um, uh, keep emphasizing that what we're cultivating is happiness, well-being. Different kinds of joy, different kinds of bliss, different kinds of happiness, different kinds of contentment, um, uh, different forms of well-being. And it's remarkable that a person can, through something like meditation, uh, begin feeling uh, easier and easier, have easier and easier, easier access to inner states of well-being. And it's a remarkable thing in meditation to come to the day when it's possible to feel a real contented, happy, fulfilling, satisfying feeling of happiness f- for no reason. In terms of the in the usual thing, we have reasons, right? Like I just won the lottery or... I, you know, I got the best date, or I got a promotion, or, you know, or it was a nice day. Nothing, nothing has changed in the external world. What's changed is the mind has gotten settled and focused and uh, no longer in conflict with anything. And a mind which is no longer in conflict and settled and harmonious uh, releases a lot of... Um, you know, feelings of well-being, of harmony, of goodness, of uh, being settled. And uh, nowadays they say it's because of the endorphins and serotonin gets released. That, you know, that's, I don't care where it comes from. <laughs> <clears throat> and then this thing about confidence is important. That uh, uh, when the mind is, gets trained well, and we're able to kind of become masters of our minds, and we have some ability to uh, be steady and stable. We have some ability to connect to a sense of well-being, some ability to uh, be, um, uh, not be uh, impacted by every little thing that happens in life, but kind of more spacious and, and, and uh, porous to it. Then um, it can feel a lot of confidence. We can go through the world and not feel afraid, or as afraid, not feel so fragile, not feel like uh, we're at the whims of whatever changing circumstances are here. And, um, and there can be a strong sense of confidence, both in oneself, but also in the trainings, in the practices we have. That these practices we're doing, mindfulness and concentration and compassion, uh, uh, give us tools to go th- navigate through the world that makes things better. So part of the function of the second training, it's training in samadhi, is stability, happiness, and confidence. This is particularly important because um, uh, uh, of what's going to happen in the third training. The third training is training in wisdom. Now, in principle, wisdom sounds like an, you know, always a good thing. Uh, it, it's probably fine to call it wisdom. I prefer to call it insight because what we're looking, because wisdom can suggest to some people that. Uh, we're going to learn something that's wise, let's learn knowledge, and then we're going to carry it around with us, you know, portable knowledge, and be able to apply it to all kinds of situations, because that, that means what, that's what wise is. Whereas uh, in the Buddhist tradition, this word for panya 
is not is, is has more to do with insight or perception or discernment in the moment that we see for ourselves in the moment what's going on and so the wisdom we need is revealed <clears throat> in the in the present uh, as it's needed as opposed to bringing along with us pre-learned ideas of what's the truth is or what's valuable that we're then applying everywhere. There is that kind of wisdom. It's, that's, it can be good. But, um, but the essential wisdom we're training in is the ability to really see what's happening in the moment. And that's why mindfulness is so important. To really cultivate the capacity to really take a good look. What's happening now? What's happening now? What's happening with, internally with me now? What's happening around me? What's happening now? And then in that clear seeing, that the wisdom of, that brings freedom or ease or a healthy response situation is available. And so there are, <clears throat> uh, in the cultivation of wisdom or insight, there are three insights <clears throat> that uh, are primary for Buddhists, for the early Buddhism, for our practice here. <clears throat> And these three um, are the opposite of the things that the, uh, uh, the training in samadhi was cultivating. So the opposite of stability, the opposite of happiness, and the opposite of uh, conf- self-confidence, kind of. And um, so we're cultivating stability, and we're, cultiv- and we're cultivating and cultivating the, the mind to be stable so it can have the insight into instability. We're cultivating the mind to be happy so it can have insight into unhappiness, into suffering. We're cultivating confidence so we can have insight into uh, the absence of self or self-identity. Now, if you just tell people to cultivate those four, three insights, you know, right off the street, you know, come to Buddhism, and um, we're going to really show you so, so, uh, how impermanent things are, unstable things are, and we're going to really show you how much, there's just lots of suffering, and we're really going to show you that there's, you know, you know, you can't find any self. It's just like bad news for some people. You know, some people um, live amazingly unstable lives, growing up in war zones and poverty and fractured families, and uh, they didn't have any stability growing up. And to tell them in Buddhism you're going to learn to have insight into how unstable the world is, it's going to kind of really push them over the edge. Some people are just suffering so much, amazing amount of suffering. They say that everyone comes to Buddhism because of suffering, and so then you're told first thing in through the door, yeah, come here and we're really going to show you how to see suffering. <laughs> you know, you'll suffer better. You know, that's not going to, you know, that's not inspiring. And then if, uh, and then uh, some people have very unstable and unformed concepts of self. They have very little self-confidence, uh, very poorly f- formed self-understanding and uh, inner stability of and so to be told that there's no self, which sometimes there's se- people say in Buddhism, uh, that can either, they can feel like I'm home, or they can feel like, um, you know, even more kind of lost in what to do. So that's why the three samadhi trainings are important, because we wait, it's really good to have a healthy, strong stability. It's really good to have a capacity for well-being and have it be part of one's life. It's really good to have confidence and self-confidence and just really kind of show up in this kind of way. With those as a support, and this kind of like that, well, that's a state of how we are, then it's a lot easier to see the phenomenal degree to which this world that we live in, this experience of the world, is constantly shifting and changing. There's no lasting stability. Everything is in constant and changing all the time. But we see that, and we're not troubled by it, because we're seeing it from this vantage point of stability. 
there's something very important about seeing how much suffering there is, how much stress there is in this life. Uh, it's phenomenal how much there is in this world of ours. But to see it through uh, the eyes of happiness or well-being. This happened to me when I was practicing uh, Vipassana in Burma. I've been practicing for on retreat for a couple of months. And, um, you know, so I spent a lot of time looking at my mind. And I was doing walking meditation one day. And um, my mind was very quiet and pretty stable. And uh, there was a lot of joy as I was doing walking meditation. I was concentrated and there's a lot of joy and happiness and stillness. But, you know, my mind was still thinking sometimes. You know, th- thoughts would bubble up. And some of those thoughts were relatively innocent. They were difficult thoughts. But I could, because of the sensitivity I had, I could feel that even those so-called innocent, simple thoughts had inherent in them a degree of agitation, a degree of stress. And I could only see it because my whole system was so peaceful. I think if I'm, you know, running around Redwood City and shopping and, you know, making dinner for my kids and doing everything, you know, like, I, I'm not going to notice this subtle, subtle little tension of, you know, thinking, like, what should we have for dinner today? Maybe. <laughs> and, um, and uh, but in that context of being on retreat, I saw that all these little thoughts that I had had inherent in them a degree of, of suffering. And, and the next moment I thought, wow. I knew there was a lot of suffering in the world. There's a lot more than I realized. If everyone's having these subtle thoughts all the time that have a little inherent agitation or stress in it, wow, the amount of suffering in this world is really immense. I was kind of blown away by the scale of suffering. I didn't get depressed uh, because I was seeing it through the eyes of feeling happy and having a lot of settled joy. It's a remarkable juxtaposition. And with that juxtaposition, um, I felt more inspired to practice in order to get to the bottom of that suffering, in order to come to the end of it, in order to understand it deeply, in order to come back into the world and try to help people so they don't suffer as much. So that joy was a very important part of that, you know, the bit what, uh, you know, putting a context and seeing that suffering. And then uh, one of the things that happens as Vipassana practice deepens, we see that uh, all the different data points of experience that arises and passes in the moment to moment, that none of those sensations and experiences of the moment qualifies as that is who I am. That's really my true nature. Turns out the ideas of a true nature of who I am is kind of an abstraction. And most ideas of who I am as a self are abstractions. But when you're really in the moment to be with experiences as they come and go, there's a kind of impersonal quality that's quite liberating to see. To see a thought arise, even a a horrific thought, and don't take it personally. It's It's just thoughts are just nature, having a thought, having a little burp a mental burp or something. And, um, and uh, it just, you know, it's, I, don't have to, I don't have to say it's my thought or your thought or just, just a thought arises. A feeling is there, just a feeling. And it becomes really clear that having a particular emotion or feeling or thought or reaction or anything, um, yes, yeah, it's really there, I feel it and recognize it, but it doesn't make any sense to ha- assume or claim that that defines who I am. That, li- that limits us and it reduces our freedom to take any particular thing or any generalization as the self. And so for some people, when they get to this deep state of vipassana and they can't find any se- anything that qualifies as itself, they get disoriented. But if you go into those states with a lot of confidence there's no disorientation that happens. The confidence carries us through. Wow, look at this. I can't find any self here. Wow. (laughs) That's pretty cool. 
you know, I'm confident where I'm sitting. I'm here. You know, there's, you know, there's, there's presence and strength and happiness and stability and all these things. And and uh, yes, and there's no nothing qualifies as, as a self. So three trainings. Three principles to support the trainings. The principle of uh, not causing harm, cultivating what is helpful in our hearts and minds, and purifying the heart. The first training is a training in ethics. We train ourselves to ethically through our actions, to be ethical in our speech, and to have some semblance of an ethical mind. <clears throat> the three tra- trainings in samadhi is trainings to cultivate stability, cultivate happiness, and cultivate uh, confidence. Those, in turn, support the cultivation of the third training, which is cultivating uh, a deep insight, deep perception in, uh, it, usually said, imp- impermanence, suffering, and not self. And all those together are there to create a foundation, a stability, an insight, a strength of mind, so that uh, we're, we have the confidence, the happiness, the, the, the real feeling of insight and self-understanding where something deep inside of us can let go. And that which we let go, this deep inside, is the deepest clinging attachments that we have. And to let go of attachments is one of the great things. And it turns out there are, there's lots of lists of different kinds of attachments, but there is a list of three. <laughs> and um, and uh, I, don't th- I don't know if I have, a, there's so many lists of these things that we let go of, uh, the attachments, so I, I don't know quite have them right, but I, I think that one of the lists of three is uh, letting go of uh, attachment to sensual desire or comfort, letting go of attachment to uh, self-identity, and letting go of attachment to our views, the stories we live by. So good things come in three. Three letting goes. And, um, and it's uh, part of the ecosystem. In different times and different situations, we emphasize different ones. Uh, different, become relevant at different times, and to get you know over time doing Buddhist practice over time, you get a better, better sense and understand uh, these different elements of these different trainings that we do, and we know which to call upon at any given time, any given day. Uh, you know, it looks like you know I'm going to Las Vegas, so I think I need to work on the first training. You know, of ethics. You know, or you know, I'm going to a very difficult family gathering. I think probably what's needed is the second training. I need a lot of stability and, you know, prepare myself. And, uh, or maybe uh, there are situations where um, you're going to go on retreat. And, uh, and there is a time where maybe, oh, this is, this, now I'm ready to really see what's going on here. And so the three insights are through the training and wisdom. Now that's relevant for me. But it morphs and changes in different circumstances, and, and, and as I said, over over the over time of practicing over and over again, uh, we get to know the map, we get to know the ecosystem, the geography of the whole thing, and we get we learn how to navigate in that geography uh, in a smooth, easy way, as opposed to thinking there's one practice, one understanding. This is how it is. Uh, that's not really good for ecosystems. Um, it's uh, you know our lives are more fluid and organic. And uh, so please, don't harm, don't, please cultivate what is helpful, helpful qualities of mind, and purify your hearts. You have, we all, we all have a precious human heart. And we'd like to, it's good to take care of it. It's good to care for it and value it and be the custodians of this good human heart that we have. And these three, tra- three trainings are a way 
of caring for our good hearts, cultivating it, developing it, and purifying it. So um, I saw a hand. Did, was that a hand? I had a question about. Um, I had a question about the um, the third one when you said uh, purifying, <coughs> purifying the heart. Um, like I got a little lost into, you know, all the ramification at the beginning. So, how, which specific sub training? are related to purifying the heart. I mean, I have a feeling it's wisdom, but I, I'm not so sure. Yeah, uh, they, they're, they're, they're all purifying the heart. What we're purifying the heart of is from its attachments. And so when we train in ethics, there is a kind of uh, purification of certain things, the coarser things. Training in samadhi is a little bit more refined, what we're working on. So there is a kind of purification, but it's all temporary because you can, you can slide back. And uh, it's a training in wisdom that leads to a more uh, lasting purification because that's what helps to uproot the attachments as opposed to just uh, have them abate or be aside. So in the back there? All the way in the back. Thank you, Gil, for laying out the the map. <laughs> and it's like you're giving us Google directions. <laughs> <laughs> and I'm wondering, is the destination no self? And could you describe and explain what no self is? Yeah, it can be confusing. I'll try it. And maybe one of these Sunday mornings I can give a whole talk on this. Um, the uh, there's a uh, very, it's very very we have to be very careful with the words that we choose, and uh, so you said you said no self right, um, and um, uh, because that, that, imp- that the, to word it that way implies something. The literal probably the literal translation from the ancient language is not self, and it's considered a characteristic of things. It's a it's a, things are characterized as as not self. So this bell that I'm holding in my hand is, um, is not me. It's not self. And that's pretty easy to see, right? Um, you know, just, you know, I might, maybe, I, you know, maybe it's mine, but it's not me. And, um, and so that's easy to see. And then, it, but maybe it's a little bit harder to see uh, around my clothes because, you know, you know, that's what makes a person is the clothes they wear, right? And, or their car or, you know, their possessions or something. But actually, you know, to really look, that's not, that's not myself, my clothes, my possessions, my things. So then you look more closely, like say if you clip your fingernail and your fingernail's on the, you know, on the bathroom counter, um, is that you? By the time it's no longer on you, it's clipped off. No, no, that's not myself. That's just, you know. And so... We st- slowly begin asking these questions, shaving away. No, that's not myself. Is your hair the self? No. Is uh, if, if you have two kidneys, are the kidney yourself? Or your is your eyelashes yourself? And your you know your ear canal is that the self? And then no, no. These these things are not self. Self is not the, any of these things. And. Um, and so what happens in that process of going through this, and it's not like, a, it's not like a, uh, we're thinking it this way, but it becomes, as, my mind gets quiet, as the mind gets quieter and quieter and more concentrated, what we see uh, is what, what slows up the mind. What, we see where we're caught. And one of the places people are caught is by assuming, maybe it's very subconsciously, this is who I am. And... Um, and so then, then we can't settle more because we're at a degree of agitation. So if I'm, um, so I used to, th- uh, when I was, I have a kind of thigh high forehead. And when I was in middle school, uh, I was very concerned. I, I kind of, that's what I discovered. I had a thigh high forehead, which was clearly a fault. <laughs> and, uh, and, uh, and I was quite concerned that this meant that soon I would be bald. And so I spent an inordinate amount of time in middle school, 
measuring with my finger the distance from the top of you know my nose and my ridge, you know, the, the you know, uh, you know, to make sure that it wasn't receding. And I can still do it, and it hasn't done. <laughs> I did it so much that I, you know, the uh, because uh, somehow or other, I, mean, I didn't have that language for myself. Somehow, the true self of Gill was somehow connected to that forehead and hairline and all that. So I was agitated and preoccupied, and you know, I don't know what was going on in class. I was busy. <laughs> And so, so now I'd say, you know, Gil, is, are, you, are you defined by your, you know, your, your forehead and high forehead or something? And I don't, couldn't care less. I don't think about it. That's who I essentially am. I don't, so, not so concerned. Some of you remembered if you were back at the, also in middle school, maybe you had zits. Men are horrified to go to school with zits, right? And now if you get zits, I hope it doesn't matter much. And as people age, there are things that people identify, that's who I am that they outgrow. No, I'm not that anymore. I'm not that. It's okay. And so this process of slowly realizing I don't have to identify myself or see myself in these different things. Um, that's what this no, not self process is. Not that. Not that. Not that. There's no way that it's not a statement that there is no self. That statement is just confusing. And that ends up in a philosophical quagmire. What do you mean? There's no self, and I'm here, and you know, you know, if there's no, you know, there's no self. Who is it that has to? Who's hungry? You know, and maybe if there's no self here, and I'm hungry, maybe you should eat. <laughs> uh, so it's there's not a statement about there is no self. It's it's very particular. It's always this is not self. This is not self. This is not self. And as, this, as the meditation gets, it, it's not like a complicated thing that the mind has to think about. As the mind gets quieter and quieter, it bumps up against the place where it's not so quiet around the self thing. Wow, I didn't know I was identified with you know, this, my nose, or, you know, or my, you know, you know I, took my, I took my anger as who I really am, and no wonder I'm so, you know, feel so bad about myself or I took, I take my, you know, my, my history, my experience as a child, that's who I really am. Wow, I can see now, I'm holding on to that, that's who I am. Okay, I don't need to do that anymore. Let's not see that as a self, not that, not that, not that. And, and that, as that process goes deeper and deeper, something really beautiful lets go, or uh, I mean, it's a beautiful letting go happens. And to be able to experience purity of heart, ease of heart, and openness of heart, or freedom of heart, that in no way needs to be defined by anything we would call a self. Does that make some sense? Thank you so much. Yeah. So, um, but in the meantime, uh, uh, you know, uh, the assumption about this Buddhist practice is that uh, is there's, a, there's a lot of emphasis on the person, you, have efficacy, can take responsibility, can develop confidence, can really kind of muster yourself as a, what looks like a very strong, integrated person who is engaged in the world and engaged in the practice. It isn't like we're now kind of, well, there's no self here, I might as well just be self-effacing and just be empty and... and and be a wallflower. It's the opposite, hopefully. So uh, it was great if uh, you would stay and meet each other and bring the, your wonderful selves <laughs> to say hello to each other and then spend a little time in community. And it's a friendly group here. And so if you're new here uh, uh, or not new here, you turn to someone next to you and welcome them, say hello. and and uh, invite them to have lunch and, and chat. And thank you for being here. <laughs>